Joining me from San Francisco is Marcy Donosky. She's executive director of the Center for Genetics and Society. Um, you spoke at an event at UC Santa Barbara on this subject, a very provocative uh, title, Should We Genetically Modify Our Children? So these used to be the stuff of philosophical questions or science fiction, a world where you could design super babies, pick the color of your child's hair, height, uh, all those sorts of things. But is science fiction actually inching closer to reality? Well, a lot of people think it is. And uh, a few years ago, a new gene editing tool um, known as CRISPR was introduced that is more accurate and easier to use and cheaper than previous generations of genetic engineering techniques. But um, it's far from accurate enough to use in this kind of setting, that is to change the cells uh, of every, in, in the whole body of any future children and all of that child's subsequent offspring. So it's one thing to use gene editing to help existing people who are sick, it's something very, very different both from a technical point of view, an ethical and a social point of view, to use it to try to alter the genes of future children. I guess some might say the plus side, if you were to look at the flip side of this, is that it, it might, uh, the technology might actually theoretically eradicate debilitating diseases like Huntington's disease. What would you say to people that might pose that argument? Well, that sounds plausible and like a worthy goal on first glance. But uh, actually, the medical argument for using gene editing in human reproduction is exceedingly weak. And that's because for those kinds of really serious condition, if you're at risk of transmitting that to your child, you can already do that with a safer, much safer, much less socially fraught technique that's been available in fertility clinics for decades. So this embryo screening technique will permit people who are at risk of passing on a serious condition to avoid doing that and to have a child who's genetically related to both members or a heterosexual couple. So there's really no good medical argument or compelling reason to move ahead mm. with this technology at all. Uh, so Marcy, let me ask you this, globally speaking, in what countries do you find enthusiasm for this and what countries are already thinking about the serious implications that you brought up, already putting in place laws or at least debating or thinking about the ethical implications? Well, around the turn of the century, this was considered in the legislatures of dozens of countries. And in every country where it rose to that level, laws were passed to prohibit using genetic engineering in human reproduction. Um, and there's also a binding international treaty that the Council of Europe put together also around the turn of the century. So most countries have official, most countries that have developed advanced biotech sectors have laws that say that this is a no-go zone. There are no countries that have adopted, that have considered it and said, yes, let's go ahead. However, in a couple of countries, there are enthusiasts now who think that because this is something we may be able to do technically, we should go ahead and do it. And that's a really poor reason to put uh, children, future children at risk, families at risk, and to uh, put society at risk by raising the possibility that we're going to build a future of genetic haves and have-nots. Mm -hmm. That's and, not a world we want to live in. And, and what, what might that world look like? Well, the concern is that uh, if these kinds of inheritable genetic modifications were permitted for any reason, then there would be no way to limit their use to a narrow set of conditions. And that marketing offers would kick in, the fertility industry would get involved, parents would be persuaded, like these parents uh, in this case that we're talking about apparently were, that this was something that would give their children a better start in life. And these procedures will always be quite expensive. Even traditional fertility treatment is quite expensive. So these offers of genetic upgrades would be taken up by people who are already affluent, who, are, who could afford it. And then whether or not there was any biological reality to the claimed uh, genetic engineering techniques, whether it made any difference at all, those engineered children would be treated as if they were enhanced and superior. Mm -hmm. And boy, you know, in a world where we have resurgent racism, xenophobia, growing socioeconomic disparities, 
the last thing we need is to have one group of people who considers themselves and is considered by others to be biologically superior to everyone else. Well, you've certainly given us a lot to think about. Marcy, thanks so much for joining us from San Francisco. You're very welcome.